Oh, yes. Yes, that's absolutely right. And uh, he came down and uh, he was exhausted when he got down there. And, but he thought that he was going to have to go through a whole series of things such as our guest yesterday did. <laughs> <laughs> and I put him to bed. I said, no, you're not doing a thing until uh, the, um, uh, till the, the late afternoon when um, you'll have a, something to go to. And, oh, he was so thankful. He was so thankful. So that, uh, when I later called and asked if I could interview, he said yes. Now, I had not clerked for a lower court judge which was uh, something everybody did. And um, we got halfway through the interview and he stopped me and he said, look, I'm never going to have two law clerks again. If you will be my only law clerk, you can have the job. How long did it take you to respond? <laughs> well, I went home and talked to my wife about it and Thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, why did you? Why did you select Jackson? I mean, there were other justices. <clears throat> well, uh, first because I had made that contact with him. Um, secondly, he knew my father. Thirdly, I admired him as a as a justice. His opinions. Um, that's about it. I know we've talked a lot in the past about just your time there, but did you know he was ill at the time? I mean, you know, he obviously had the heart attack. He was in the hospital during Brown versus Board of Education. Did you did you have a sense of his dire straits? Well, toward the end. Yeah. But uh, when I first went uh, to clerk for him, no. Do you get a sense he just uh, you, you got some advice during while he was in the hospital to take it easy, you know, relax? Do you get a sense that he just sort of did not take that advice? Um, yeah, I I was at the hospital when uh, Earl Warren brought the initial draft of the Brown decision over for him, and I excused myself from the room and went down the hall and waited until Warren left and I came back and Jackson asked me to read it and we talked about it. And <clears throat> I thought it was fine because it was easily understood by every man on the street. I said it was a lacking in some law. <laughs> uh, but he, he said he thought so and he uh, it wanted to add a couple of sentences, which I took took to Earl Warren, and Warren, being the uh, um, politician that he was, vetoed them because he said that reading between the lines, somebody would detect that this ruling was soon going to go to other things besides schools. And he didn't want that impression to be left, even though he knew that was what was going to happen. So anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, and I knew that then when Justice to the courthouse for the Brown rendition, mm -hmm. that uh, he should not have done that. There's a movie called Separate But Equal, which you are portrayed on exactly what you just talked about where Earl Warren came in and they met a, uh, a young Barrett Prettyman. Were you involved in that movie at all? As no. Far as, no. Oh, I know. Um, it was about the rendering of uh, Brown and I advised Sidney Boitier and uh, forget the, the two two principal guys in the movie how to stand at the Supreme Court when they argue a case um, 
Yeah, I remember that. So Sidney Poitier asked for your autograph? <laughs> I, I think the dealings with Castro and the release of the Bad Pigs prisoners would have to stand out. A couple of cases that I won that I thought I really had no business winning, which I won't name, <laughs> uh, would stand out. A couple of um, pro bono cases. One of them resulted in a letter from J. Edgar Hoover that I'll mention to you um, was incredible. I was appointed to represent a lady of the night who was out to 14th Street, 2 o'clock in the morning, waving down cars. And uh, instead of being arrested for soliciting prostitution, she was arrested for um, some, oh, the same kind of thing if you jaywalk on the street. And the statute defined that conduct as leading a profligate life. And so every person who got on the stand, I said, what does leading a profligate life mean to you? And of course I got some wild answers. <laughs> and I was going to contend that uh, since nobody could understand what that meant, that it was unconstitutional. Well, I got a policeman on the stand, the one who had arrested her, as a matter of fact, and I said, what does leading a profligate life mean to you? Well, it means you know, not uh, not doing your work all the time and taking time off and things like that. And I said, well now, J. Edgar Hoover, for example, I understand that he uh, goes to the races and I assume bets on the horses and and uh, would you see say that he's leading a proper good life? <laughs> and this guy hesitated and thought about it and he said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Well, a reporter who had been covering another trial <laughs> happened to be that trial was over and he happened to be in the courtroom. So there was a small story about Jagger who were being tagged a profligate. <laughs> and I had two agents in my office <laughs> with a letter from Jagger Hoover. Well, it's the damnedest letter you've ever seen. It, 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 it just virtually swore at me said I was trying to ruin his life and he attended the racetrack only with loyal Americans and he only did it on occasional Saturdays and he went on and on. I mean the thing was 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 nuts. So I called my father and uh, I said what in the world do I do now? And he said well write him and explain to him that this was the greatest insult and uh, uh, the greatest um, um, what am I trying to say? Um, Probably a compliment. Compliment, thank you. Um, that you could give him, because anybody who thought that J. Edgar Hoover was leading a proper good life had to misunderstand the, the um, statute. So I wrote to um, J. Edgar Hoover, and of course I got no answer. <laughs> But I bet I have a file on, on me at the, at the, at the uh, FBI building. <laughs> you know, Barry, I just want to tell you that I have run out of film, but I, I can't run out of, I'm not running out of my admiration for you and all that you've done here. This, you know, for, you've done for the Jackson Center, you've done for the legacy of law. You know, you're just an amazing human being, and I'm not blowing you up with a glory gun, but this is at least an opportunity to say thank you for everything. Well, thank you. <laughs>